appropriate for us to do New Year's resolutions. I hate those. Mainly because I'm good for about a week or two after. And then I go back to the old thing. You know. I try to tell myself, I'm, I'm, I drink way too much Mountain Dew. Way too much Mountain Dew. Uh, and so I try to be good and, and drink the Mountain Dew Zero. It's awful. It is awful. My tongue rejects it. As soon as it comes in, it wants to... Bleh! And so I, I tell myself, but if I'm not doing concrete work too much, I'm going to get fat if all I do is drink Mountain Dew, so I need to do the Mountain Dew Zero. I last about two weeks. So New Year's resolutions are kind of defeating. They're defeating, and, and in, in a lot of ways, we tell ourselves they're kind of pointless. But if there's one thing I've learned that Americans are hungry for, Americans, is the simple. We're hungry for the simple life. This book that I'm reading by Tom and Art Rayner, or Rainier, I can't remember how to say their last name, but it's Tom and Art, a father and son duo. And they're really big on doing surveys and statistics, so you know this is the kind of book that I like. <laughs> and so they're doing this survey, and, and, they, and they, they gather a whole bunch of people, and it's not just Christians that they gathered together. They said about 38% of those in the part of this questionnaire were Christians. But one thing that they found across the board, Christians, non-Christians alike, something that they were hungry for was the simple life. For them, life has gotten too fast. Many of our gadgets that we have today, you know, they're meant to make life more simple. It's only really made things more complicated. Mainly because we are inundated with all kinds of information. Whether it's false information or true information, we have it at the palm of our hands. And millennials and, and the generations after them are the first ones throughout human history who are able to go and find answers to their questions without having to go to an adult. And it's right there on their phone. And so some, some, a lot of times they're getting some misinformation, there's no context, there's no background, and all it has done is sped life up and made things complicated. I'm the kind of person, now, um, when I put a burrito into the microwave, hit one minute, stand in front of it and say, come on, you're taking too long already. We have this concept in America, it started with us, fast food. We don't even want to wait to get it cooked anymore. We are in a hurry, and Americans are overcommitted, overstressed, and underfunded. Underfunded. <laughs> but what is this life that Jesus spoke about? John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. They... The survey showed that Christians and non-Christians are like are living a less than abundant life. Both Christians and non-Christians alike. So the survey showed four areas that a lot of people crave the simple life. First one was time. People want simple so they can have more time in areas that mattered most to them. How many of us can relate to that? They wanted more simple in relationships to help them with the balance of the relationships, to create better relationships with others. How many of us can identify with that? Money. People want simple. They want, they want freedom from the past due bills, limited income, lack of savings, and increasing debt. How many of us can identify with that? <laughs> and believe it or not, they found it very interesting, given the fact that only 38% of those who took this survey were evangelical Christians, the rest were not, 78% wanted a more simple life with God. Even those who did not identify themselves as evangelical Christians knew 
there was something missing in their life, whether they had been exposed or where they had gone to church at one time and fell away, whatever it was, over 70-some percent said that they wanted simple with God. They clearly saw that they were too busy for God. How many of us can identify with that? So here at this time of year, we're beginning 2022, we have this opportunity to look at our lives through the lens as a pattern that the Lord has given us. He has given us the simple life. He has this blueprint for us to follow. We're going to do this study of the Lord's Prayer. That's what today is about, by the way. We're just setting that up. We're not getting into that just yet. But New Year's resolutions. Do you crave the simple life? Does anybody in here crave the simple life? Yes. I got somebody back there. I might have to get John's picture. It says, can I get an amen? And hang it again. <laughs> Well, there was four areas, four areas, and this is not coincidental. This is not coincidental. Stacks and surveys, or st st statistics and surveys and everything line up with Scripture. It's not, it's not by accident. There's four main areas, and as we go through the Lord's Prayer, we'll find that these four main areas to help us get to the simple life is addressed in the pattern that Jesus gave us in the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But there's four main areas that Tom and Art Rainier or Rainer says that we need to, to get us focused towards the simple life. First thing is clarity. All right? You know where you're going. You need a blueprint for that. And, and I don't know about you, but full disclosure, there are a lot of times where I don't even know where I'm going. I don't even know where I'm going. And in the morning, sometimes I'll drive to a certain spot and don't even know how I got there. That's kind of scary enough as it is, right? But sometimes I got so many things on my plate, I don't even know where to start. I don't know, I don't have a plan, I don't know how to get all of this stuff, and sometimes the best thing I can do is just start with one thing at a time. But I don't even know where that one thing is I need to start with. Can you identify with that? We need a blueprint. We need something to follow. We need clarity. We need to know where we're going. We'll get to it, but we have that in the Lord's Prayer. Movement. Congestion is a nasty word. Whether you're talking about sinuses or traffic, right? One way or the other, it means stand still. It means stand still. Maybe you're here. Congestion in life means that you're not making any progress at all. But you're kind of stuck and haven't felt like you've grown or made any kind of movement at all. Many of the things that we have in our life is keeping us down. Whatever your scenario or situation is, maybe you can relate to this lack of movement, congestion, being stuck where you're at. The next one, alignment. I don't know how many of you have driven out in western Kansas. It's flat as a pancake, right? We go to Manhattan, it's flat as a pancake. And sometimes you get a little lax and you know, you've got this long, straight highway in front of you. It's flat. There's not many people out there, so you kind of relax a little bit. Maybe you want to adjust the radio because there's not a very good song on there, so you kind of let your hands off of the wheel and if you don't have good wheel alignment in your car, you start pulling to one side. How many of you have experienced that? Especially if you're a curb checker like me. You might have, you might need, yeah, we got some people who identify with that. Good, amen. And you need some alignment. And you know that if you don't get those wheels aligned, it will only get worse. And before long, you'll find yourself having to keep both hands on the wheel at all times, and you're fighting the road. I don't know if you, how many of you procrastinators in here have done that, right? Am I the only one? <laughs> yeah, you feel like you're fighting the road. It's a straight road, but you feel like you're fighting the road. Maybe some of us might be at this point in our life. Many of us might feel like we're fighting the road in our life. We're doing everything we can just to stay on the road. 
Because his life is complicated and, it, and there's a lot of misinformation out there and we don't know what to believe. And we need an alignment. And then the fourth thing that they found to this survey to create a simple life is focus. And a simple life means we will need to eliminate some things in our life, even good things, so we can make room for the best things. I think if there's one thing in America, and American Christianity included, we're really good about piling things on our plate. I know Crystal and I have, have done this. We're, we're so used to being busy that even when we have a day off, we're looking for things to schedule on the day off because we have a day off and we don't have anything to do, but there's things that need to be done, so let's do this, let's do this, and do this on our day off. Maybe you're the same way. We'll go back to a call to worship, Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is to let go of some things. As we're approaching 2022, there are things in our life that are good. That are good. And for everybody, it's all different. That's why we're being very obscure when we're saying things. Because for everybody, it's a different thing. But right now, the Lord may be identifying some of these things into your heart, into your mind right now. But there are things in our life that are good. There are good things. But they're weighing us down and keeping us from getting the best things from God. But because they're good, we're tricked into thinking we need to keep them. We need to hold on to them. We're storming our backpack and, oh, that's a good thing. 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 Next thing you know, you can't hardly walk forward. We need focus. We need direction. We need to know what is it we have to let go. What is it that I need to, to have with me to press toward what God has for me? what God has for you this year, 2022. What do we need to do to press toward Christ? Well, letting go is very hard to do, and that brings us to Genesis and Abram, the calling of Abram. I begin with Acts, though, because in Genesis, actually, let's go to Genesis. I'll go back to Acts. This is kind of complicating, I know, but stay with me. Because when I read Genesis or whatever, I was always kind of confused. Did God call Abram in Ur or did God call Abram in Haran? Because when you read these accounts in Genesis, you get the impression Abram was called in Haran. Right? So we'll start with Genesis chapter 11, 31 through 32, and then we'll go right into Genesis chapter 12, Andre, and then we'll go back to Acts. All right, so Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. And then Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And this is the way it goes in, in Scripture. It cuts off right there at Terah. And then we get right into here. And the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a gr into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let's go to 4 and 5, Andrea. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. 
All right, so we'll go back to Acts chapter 7 and let me talk a little bit about what's going on here because it was confusing to me as a young person. When I read this in Genesis chapter 11 and then right into verse 12, I was confused. Did God call Abram while he was in Haran or did he call him in Ur? So we have here now some background in the New Testament when Stephen was speaking to his future killers. And he said, and he, to this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Isn't God wonderful? He clears things up for us, right? Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. Something else that kind of stuck out to me when I was younger, I read this passage of Scripture and I didn't, I didn't think God told him where to go. He said, go, and then when you get there, I'll tell you when you get there. But see, when we have Scripture here, when you're reading and you're putting things together, <clears throat> we find out that God did tell Abram to go to Canaan. Go to Canaan. When you get there, I'll show you what is going to be yours. I will show you this land. So in my mind, this scenario, when we go to Genesis chapter 11, I play out this scenario. How God tells us, Terah decided to just up and leave and go to Canaan. It was, it was confusing to me because I know God called Abram to Canaan. God did not call Terah to Canaan. So I'm wondering what's going on in my mind, and so this scenario played out. It's a natural scenario. Abraham, in, this, in these days, everybody lived under the patriarch's tent, if you will. They didn't live in the same tent, but it was the, the household. Everybody stayed with the family. Nobody left. That's the way it was. And so I can imagine God comes to Abram, just the way Stephen said. He comes to him in Mesopotamia, in Ur of the Chaldeans, and he says, you need to leave your country, you need to leave your family and go to Canaan. And so, Abram's not going to pack things up right away and just leave in the cover of darkness. He's going to come to his father and say, Dad, God come to me. He spoke to me. Said, I need to pack things up. i got to leave my country. i got to leave you. Love you, but goodbye. And so his dad, what do you think his response is going to be? Where are you going? Where are you going? And Abram, all he could tell him was, he told me to go to Canaan. I don't know when I get there. I don't know where I'm going to stop. I don't know what's going to happen when I get there. By all accounts, Abram and his family, they never left Ur. They were, they were rich. They were happy. They liked worshiping the moon gods that they worshiped there in Ur. They never left. And so this is going to be a strange experience for Abraham. And he doesn't know exactly where Canaan is. He doesn't know exactly what's there when he gets there. He doesn't know any of all this. He just knows God told him, go to Canaan. So I can imagine in my mind, as I'm reading this passage of Scripture, that Terah sleeps on this. And the next morning he says, I got a great idea. We're all going to go to Canaan. <laughs> We're all going to go to Canaan. This puts... Abram in an uncomfortable situation. Because you read both accounts in Haran and in Ur. What does God tell him? He needs to leave his country and he needs to leave his family. So now what's he supposed to do? His family wants to go with him to, to the land of Canaan. It's a very uncomfortable situation. You could say, you know, that's good. I like the sentiment. I wish you could come with me, but God said I had to leave you. You need to stay here. This is just me and God saying goodbye. He could have done that. And it would have taken a lot of gumption to do that. Because remember, this is a different time. This is a different culture. Terra is the patriarch. People do what he says. The kids do what he says. This is a difficult situation. But there's a reason why God told Abram he needs to leave his family. Abraham chose to do the political thing and decide to just say nothing. I think if he said something, the Lord would have told us that. He says nothing. And so what happens? 
They all gather up. They head for Canaan. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11. Andrea. Normally it's CJ back there. Andrea's back there now. She's just kind of filling in for him. So I'm going to make it very difficult for her today. Just letting everybody know. So Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. That's the plan. I'm going with you. God tells you to go to Canaan. He's my God too. We'll go. We'll go to Canaan. Wes's favorite word. But but maybe not in this context. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. See, Haran was another metro metropolis that worshipped the moon gods. And it was a lush area. Terah and Abram and Lot, these are rich people. They got a lot of flocks. They have a lot of herds. They have a lot of things they need to feed, and when they get to Haran, man, this is the place. This is paradise for Terah. They can feed all of their flocks and herds. It's flat. It's easy. Grazing. All of this. And they worship the moon gods. Man, this is just like home. We are good. And they settled there. The problem with Haran, uh, uh, other than all of the good things, The problem with Haran is that it wasn't Canaan. God didn't tell Abram, go to Haran. He told him to go to Canaan and I will show you. I think one of the big reasons why we don't enjoy this abundant, simple life that Christ has for us. We're like Abram in this, in this moment, in this passage. We're floating, right? We're caught somewhere between the old life that we left behind and the new life that God promises us in Christ. And we're partially obedient. We come to Him. We've asked God for forgiveness for our sins and then... Uh, We don't necessarily give God everything. We don't give God control over our finances. We don't give God control over our time. We don't give God control over our dreams. We don't give God control over our goals. We give Him our sin. We give Him our shame. We give Him our worries. But that's it. But with God, we need to understand something. That partial obedience is the same thing as being disobedient. See, God's an all or nothing God. We know this when we were doing the study of the churches, right? In Revelation, I'd rather you be hot or cold. You people in the middle make me want to throw up. That's basically what he said, right? When they came to Haran, they settled there. And there are several people who have different views as to how long they were there. I've seen anywhere from 6 to 14 years, 7 to 14 years, that they stayed in Haran. When I read this, I'm not, I'm not coming to the conclusion that God is telling all of us we need to leave our family. Okay? Let's not take the literal lesson here. There are spiritual lessons here for us. And I'm not also going to leave out the possibility that God is telling you to leave your family. We leave that all up to Him. He is sovereign. He is Lord. He can decide to tell each and every single one of us what to do when He chooses. Right? Right? But don't leave today that this means we'll have a family reunion and say, guys, i got to leave you. Read it in Genesis, sorry. Goodbye. You're dragging me down! (laughs) No. 
But we can see in Scripture here why God wanted Abram to leave his family. Because his family is dragging him down. And he's going along with it. He doesn't want to buck the culture. He loves his dad. He does not want to rebel against his dad. But God told him to go to Canaan. And if the rest of the family wants to stay in Haran, Abram, let them stay. You need to go to Canaan. Because that's what we get when we come to Genesis chapter 12. And the Lord said to Abram, go from your country. The King James Version is really good in some ways. He says, get thee out! <laughs> I appreciate that direct thing, right? That's a, get thee out! What are you doing? I didn't tell you to go to Haran. You're supposed to be in Canaan. Your promises are in Canaan. Your promises are not in Haran. Go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Everything that Abram brought with him from Ur drug him down. We see as his father went with him, they settled in Haran. He kept him from going to Canaan. We'll see here later that as he leaves Haran, Lot goes with him. If you read the account in Genesis, Lot is kind of a source of frustration for Abram. When God tells us that we need to leave the old life, there's a reason for it. And the old life and the old ways of depending upon ourselves and our old goals and our old dreams and everything. When we come to Christ, we give Him everything we don't hold on to anything from the old because if we do they could drag us down and keep us from receiving the full abundant simple life that god has for us see what i learned from this lesson here that it is it's not enough for you to just go to church it's not enough for you to know scripture it's not enough for you to go part way with God. You need to go all the way. we got to move from the head knowledge and come to the heart knowledge of who God is. It's a personal relationship. And the relationship requires communication. It requires you giving everything to God. And in turn, He gives you everything of Him. The question is, do you know Him? We see that in Matthew chapter 7, the person who's done some great things. He's cast out demons. That's a big thing. He's able to do great things, but what was it that he didn't have? He didn't know Jesus. Perhaps a big reason why we don't have any clarity or movement or why we are out of alignment or because we lack focus is because we've only been partially obedient to the Lord. And we haven't fully committed everything of us to Him. Our family, our finances, our jobs, our dreams, our goals. It's what James teaches us, right? Everything we say if we want to go somewhere, if we want to do something, if you guys, you kids, you want to go to college, say you want to go to K-State or whatever, what are we supposed to say? Lord willing. Why? Because that means we're putting everything under Him. I'm giving Him everything. My dreams, my goals, everything. Lord willing, I'm going to do such and such. See, we can see these promises as we continue through Gen Genesis chapter 12 with verse 2. See, God tells Abraham to leave his country. And in leaving his country, he doesn't have a nation. He doesn't have a group of people. So if Abraham leaves his country, what? I will make you into a great nation. 
You're going to leave your country, but you're going to become a nation. God promises. In leaving his family, he was leaving behind a name. And what does he say? I will make your name great. See, in leaving his family, if he just leaves, guess what else he's leaving? His inheritance. His blessings. If he leaves that behind, what does God promise Abraham? You will be a blessing. God had called him from the lesser to give him the greater. That's the simple life. The simple life is calling us. Here's what hangs us up. And this is what hangs us up in the New Year's resolutions if you guys want to come and get ready to play. This, 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 is, this is classic American culture. And this is what hangs us up. And in their survey of the simple life that, that uh, Tom and Art Rayner discovered, there was this word, this code word that you knew if people said this, resolution had two weeks of life and that was it. It's this word, soon. And all of their surveys and all the people they asked, they would ask them. So they, they would say, well, we don't spend that much time with my family at church or we don't, we don't talk about God at church or whatever. And so the, the question, the follow-up question is, when do you think that might get started? These were their responses. I will start going back to church soon. I plan to get on a daily Bible reading program soon. I plan to pray more to God than I do now. Soon. See, soon is this word in our lives that begins to congest things. Listen to the words from the writer of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If you want to gum up the works, put soon into the plans. I'm a little cynical in case some of you guys didn't know this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little cynical and I said some things to the youth that, that, that American culture has created in my view because I'm a little cynical. So this isn't the word, this is Scott here. That I want, this is American culture, this isn't our church here, right? This is American Christianity. And many times when you hear people say, let's pray about that. It really means we're not going to do anything. <laughs> That's my cynicism, right? <laughs> That's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true, but inside I think that sometimes. But can we all be honest and agree that sometimes that's, that's what happened? Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> Daily doesn't mean tomorrow. Or when you get around to it. But daily means today. Today. Right now. We're going to have a moment. You know when they come up to start playing music. You know we're about ready to do an altar call. That's the sign. We're going to have an opportunity to examine ourselves as we go into 2022. And as Jesus lays out this blueprint for us in the Lord's Prayer, are we going to be open for what He has for us? Are we really going to be willing to let go of some of the good things in our life so that we can receive some of the greater things He has for us? Maybe you're like Abram and you're floating there between the old life and the new life that Jesus promised, that abundant life. You haven't experienced that because you've only partially obeyed. Whatever your reason is, whatever your scenario is, wherever you are at in life, let today be the day you begin to get yourself realigned with Him.
But today be the day we get some clear focus on where we are going this year. Today, it starts today. Don't leave today without some clarity and focus. That might mean we have to give him some things. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus gave us a blueprint for the simple life in the Lord's Prayer. Now, there's nothing magical about these words in the Lord's Prayer. This is not an incantation. This is not something that we recite and all of a sudden everything gets better. It's a blueprint. It's a blueprint. It's a pattern. A pattern of, of how we are to live. Live our life as a worship to the Lord. Live our life in pursuit of Him. It's a blueprint for the simple life the Lord's Prayer is. And, and we, will, we will find clarity, we find movement, we find alignment, and we find focus in the Lord's Prayer. And so let's be all in for this simple, abundant life this year. I'm ready for a simple life. I'm ready to have focus. I'm ready to have some clarity. I'm ready to get rid of some of this stress, some of this anxiety, some of this weight that we've been carrying. We don't have to carry that. That is not for us to carry. Let's give it to Him and let's embrace this simple life. Say amen. 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 My takeaway from today's service is let go of the lesser that I may have the greater. Amen. And the greater is always Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I love, I don't know why it always comes into my head, but I love this saying that says, whatever the question is, Jesus is the answer. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord.